Charlotte Hi. Cox. I'm Charlotte Cox. <laughs> <clears throat> well, we know how much today we are thinking about how much we need to nourish nature and bring it back to life. Uh, but let's not forget how much we need to let nature nourish us to be in the moment and to see. This is called ordinary grace. Is it loud enough? You might see an old willow arching over the end of a terraced garden or a sunlit cattailed lakeshore ruled by one red-winged blackbird or just a clearing sky that opens up far blue space beyond near green trees. So simple, but you catch a quick sharp breath and think, beautiful, why? How do you keep the power to be nourished by everyday splendor, to recognize glimpses of beauty in such things as ordinary grace? No use in taking easy refuge in some fantasy of great design that sets you up to see only what's ordained, or some false philosophy of what you see is what you get, and vice versa, or even what you want is what you see. Reach instead into your memory depths and recall your own first infant chortle. Its wellspring lives on somewhere in your questioning rational shell, ready to let nature's familiar treasures release the delight that waits inside. And you really don't have to clap after every poem. You could just wait till the end. <laughs> This one's about the power of music to connect. It's called Hidden Wholeness. In the midst of a gray cloud of swirling talk among us, audience members waiting in the crowded concert hall, the sound of a single cello cuts a track through verbal fog with a vibrant silver beam swelling out deep and wide. As I turn to follow its path, the piano's glissando lifts the dark cloud up and away. I lean back to breathe in full. In a pause, more words descend, like murmuring bees in sunshine, or circling bats in twilight, urgent, clever, confusing. Then the piano begins again, becomes a benign south wind, joins the cello to blow aside the buzzing, flapping hum of talk to clear the air and bring to light a new wholeness, always there. Pure sound lifts our eyes, our hearts, filling all the empty space between us. This last one is, um, I'm not sure yet if it's a poem or if it's a scene from a play. It's a father and son talk called Looking Back. Who were those people in the paintings, Daddy? And why'd they live and die that way so long ago? They were primitive, my boy. Some say barbaric. Stole wives, sold children. Punished killers by killing them. They used terror and torture against their fellow humans, all in the name of vengeance, which they mistook for victory. They created armies to grab territory, wealth, the richness of the land, and did not see that war leads to naught but more war than just waste. What were they called back in the 21st century, Dad? And how could they be the ancestors of people like us? They were called humans, my son, but were only half evolved. It took many painful generations before their offspring began to change. They carved up their numbers into states or cults, set boundaries to keep their differences clear instead of seeing the rightness of the whole. Their leaders had many names, shifting roles like politician, preacher, president, whose duty it was to divide, to barricade, to pit each group against another. What happened to them all then? Because we never see any of these strange creatures now, centuries later. Well, almost all died out, of course, because their anger, fear, and hatred 
made them kill each other, and so, in the larger sense, themselves. All but a few, mostly the poets, artists, musicians, who fled to shelter in the forests, mountains, nature's hidden places, where they held on, enduring many centuries of gradual change, planting their genetic seeds for a better kind of human. You see, the traits that led to death all perished. The ones that held up life survived, so that now we can look back with thanks and relief for what we have become. Thank you.